call the meeting to order. That clock says 7 o'clock. So um, it is uh, 7 o'clock. This is the regular city council meeting from Minnetrista, uh, July 19th. Welcome, everybody. And uh, first order of business, I'd like to ask that you join us in Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. So again, uh, welcome everyone here and also those that may be watching on YouTube later on. Just a friendly reminder, if you have electronic devices with you, please turn them on airplane mode, turn them off or on silent so we don't disrupt the meeting. And uh, next, I'm going to make a few um, introductions. I'm Lisa Whalen. I'm the mayor. Next to me, on my left, our council members, Mike Molitor, Pam Mortensen is absent this evening, and then we have Shannon Bruce and uh, John Chamberlain, and on the end we have um, our... Uh, contracted um, engineer with WSB, Paul Hornby. Our city clerk is Chris Lindquist, and next to her, director of administration is Cassandra Tabor. To my right, our city administrator, Mike Baroni. Brian Grimm is our finance director, and David Abel is our community development director. And then we have with Kennedy and Graven, uh, our city attorney is Ron Beatty. And then on the end, we have um, Paul Falls, who is our chief of police. So with that, um, those are the introductions that I have. We have special guests with us this evening that we'll get to in just a minute. And before then, um, is there a motion to approve the agenda as presented? So moved. Okay, is there a second? A second. Okay, motion has been made and seconded to approve the agenda as presented. Any further discussion, questions? Hearing none, all those in favor signify with aye. 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 All those opposed, motion passes. Oh. So we'll move on to our special presentations this evening. And with us this evening, we have Sherry Munson uh, with um, Centerpoint Energy. So um, who would like to make the introduction or the... Sherry's going to introduce herself. All right. Something prepared. <laughs> I assume this is where I stand, right? Yes, yeah. thank you. Okay. So this is kind of a special... Uh, a presentation for me because I actually grew up in Mound, went to high school at Mound Wisconsin High School in Trista. And I've also been um, the sales rep uh, for the New Market Development Department for the Minnetrista territory for about 20 years. So I probably have worked with a few of you guys over the years when you've done large developments. So I will just Read my little spiel here. here. <laughs> the Community Partnership Grant Program offers an opportunity for Centerpoint Energy to invest in the cities we serve. For over 145 years, we have partnered with communities supporting our shared commitment to safety while delivering safe, reliable natural gas. Since 2003, the program has awarded more than 1.5 million in donations and provided funding to support 848 projects in communities throughout the Centerpoint Energy Service Area. Through the grant program, we are able to help cities leverage local funds to purchase needed safety equipment or support safety projects that are important to your community. We are pleased to present the City of Minnetrista with a community partnership grant for $2,000 that will be used to purchase dual language automated external defibrillators. <coughs> thank you for your efforts to make our community safer. Well, thank you very much. And I'd like to also give a round of applause, if you will, not only to you, but to Cassandra Tabor and also to the Chief of Police, Paul Falls, who helped put the application and the grant together. And we're very appreciative of that. So thank you very much. If you don't mind, we'd like to take a quick picture. I would expect that. Right. <laughs> we would like to have that
Oh, <laughs> no. <laughs> okay, next um, special presentation this evening is uh, Robert Goodman, who is with us this evening, a brand new employee of ours, our brand new building inspections person. Um, That's me. Cassandra? <laughs> Robert, I'll just have you step forward. Um, Robert joined us on June 5th and has been out in the field working with our residents already. Uh, he came from private sector, construction experience, owned his own business, and so far is off and running. So I'll let him take it from here. Thank you all for coming tonight. <laughs> I wasn't looking forward to writing up any correction notices. <laughs> <laughs> written a few already. <laughs> Uh, anyway, uh, my name is Robert Goodman. Um, like Cassandra said, I come from a construction background. Um, I, I grew up in Minnesota, born and raised. Currently, uh, I'm living in St. Louis Park. Um, I made some goals a couple years ago to <coughs> change my career path. And uh, I told myself by the time I was 40, or at the age of 40, I needed to have this new career established and I kind of got close to the line because on June 12th I turned 41 so <laughs> <laughs> um, just want to thank you all for just under the giving me the opportunity to come, come aboard and work in this city and I look forward to the years to come. We are happy that you're here. Thanks. Welcome. So, welcome. 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 And Cassandra I think you want to get a picture? Yes. special presentation it's so special <laughs> um, Brian our second yeah. quarter financial update thank you madam mayor and council this is probably is recurring presentation would probably be a, right. a better but no it, I guess this is where it falls so um, attached in the packet is the uh, reports the standard reports for the sec or the second quarter the standard quarterly reports um, I think everything's tracking pretty well for 2018 uh, starting with the revenue on page four, we're at about 47%, I believe, if I get to it. So um, the big change from the first quarter is that our, our first half taxes have, have come in. So that's um, you know, good to see, as well as our building permit activity has um, picked up a lot from the first quarter, just based on the, the nature of the, I guess you can't build a lot when there was snow in April. So, um, so we're, everything's, you know, Pretty much picking up seasonally as we would think and, and as, as things happen and, and their proper timeline in the year. As far as expenditures on the next five pages, I think everything's um, tracking pretty well there. We're at 48%. Um, most things are right around that 50% other than the things that, like the fire department we've paid through the third quarter. Um, so there's little timing differences like that always, but I think we're, when I looked at last year, we were about at that 47, 48% this time of year also. And then on page 10, it's just the different uh, cash and investment report for the quarter. And um, everything s seems to be um, sitting well there. I think I notated in the memo the couple um, d funds with cash deficits, but those are just timing differences as far as getting you know, reimbursed for, for different things or getting quarterly payments or tax payments in to offset the quarterly payments for the fire fund and, and billing back uh, land use applicants for the, for the land use agency fund. So. If anyone has any questions, I'll stand for those now. Okay. Um, any questions? I had a question. On page nine, um, under park areas, there's, I just know, I scan these and I look for numbers that jump out, and sure. there's an 827% of year to date under dues and subscriptions. I was just wondering what that was for. That's a good question. Yeah, I know um, once in a while we have to. Um, you would have to look that one up just because you know it, it's a it's two thousand dollars so yeah it's it, so whether that um truly sometimes we split things between different funds as far as when we sign up for different it's uh, not a huge amount much, but, but 
Yeah. It's a huge percentage. Percentage, percentage, percentage wise. Percentage. Yeah. Yeah. I probably could check into that and, and get back to the whole council just to see if it's a for sure should have been posted to the park department or should have been, you know, maybe somewhere else in public works. Gary probably would know off the top of his head. You know, okay. <laughs> so, but I, I can make a note to, to respond back okay. to the sure. council. So. Yeah. Yep. Any other questions anyone has? No. Otherwise, good. Thank you. It's good to see this um, on a quarterly basis. Yeah, too. it's always easier to see once you get to that second quarter. The first quarter is always hard to see when our revenue yeah. is lagging so much. But that was so right, good. because we don't have yeah, the revenues yeah. in. Right. Yeah. Okay. Um, that concludes our special presentations then, and we'll move on to persons to be heard. I believe we have um, one individual. It's uh, Mr. Chris Carlson. I'm going to ask that you come to the podium. You have to state your name and address for the record, and uh, you'll have about three minutes to talk to us about what you would like to talk about, and, um, and then uh, we don't necessarily do any um, action um, at this council meeting. We may have to direct you to staff or a future council meeting, but Mr. Carlson. Uh, Chris Carlson, 5950 West Branch, and uh, I'm here tonight, and I don't know if, if the city has jurisdiction over this or not, and if you don't, uh, you can just tell me and I'll go away. But, uh, the Star Tribune likes to throw newspapers in my driveway a couple, I don't know how many times a year. And I never read them. And it's, to me, it's, it's just very wasteful. I'm the kind of person I produce one bag of garbage about this bag. Big a week, I just take it to work with me, throw it away. I take my recycle bin out to the curb only once a month, and that's because I bring everyone else's recycling from work home with me. So I just don't produce much waste, and it's very frustrating to have these newspapers flop in my driveway that I'm never going to open. And I guess re other reasons to not do it is if, if any of you believe in global warming, this is cutting down a tree, throwing it in my driveway, and I'm picking it up and putting it in the recycling bin. And if you, you don't believe in global warming or don't care about it, if you like green spaces or out cutting down trees for no reason, uh, I looked it up tonight, a six foot stack of newspapers is, you have to cut down one 35 foot tree to build that mm. and it messes up my driveway and I called one day and I said hey these people are throwing stuff in my driveway can I make them pick it up and I was told no I can't and by the way Chris if you don't pick it up we can fine you for <laughs> having a dirty driveway uh, so that was I thought that was interesting but with the technology available nowadays these companies who throw the stuff in our driveway could very very easily have a database and they could say, don't put a newspaper in there. And Have you talked to the Star Tribune? They don't want it, I guess. <laughs> it was some time ago. At the time, I didn't live in Metris. I lived in Mount. Uh, but no, they just hire people to throw one at every driveway. Huh. And uh, I can tell you if uh, for a little bit of cost, they could increase their readership, they'd do it in a second. Mm -hmm. The only way they would do this is if, I guess they were forced to, but I just don't agree with why should everyone in the community have a newspaper thrown in their driveway, whether they want it or not? And if I'm wrong, I, you know, I guess I should check to see if I could opt out. I did not do that until I came here tonight. It I, I don't. A, it was quite yeah. a few years ago that okay. I checked. So. Okay. Um, I I know that I don't get them in my driveway because we don't. <laughs> no, that's an idea. <laughs> um, and did, I. Did you call and ask them to stop? I. We used to have a subscription, and yeah. we no longer subscribe, so um, I no longer get a newspaper. I know in our um, cul-de-sac, I get it the daily and the Sunday, yeah. but on occasional Sundays, I'll see uh, cellophane paper laying in the driveway of those of those that don't get it. I imagine they're trying to generate. They're trying to generate readership. Right. Yeah. Sure, yeah. I sure. Get them. Okay. And I don't have Oh. So I don't know that there. This isn't something we can do. Well, I don't you know. Something we can do, or you something you're not interested in looking. No, at no. I, I'm. I'm not sure what jurisdiction we have over companies. I'll, maybe I'll have our attorney weigh in because. There you go. So city right. passed right. an ordinance that prevents <laughs> people from throwing okay. stuff in their driveway. Ah, well, Ron, let's Thanks. let's have him weigh in first. Thanks. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> um, I, I guess I don't really have a solution. This is not an issue 
that I've heard about. Uh, I mean, I have a subscription in my house, and so that's why I get a newspaper. I haven't noticed others in the neighborhood, in my neighborhood. I live in Golden Valley, uh, having that. Um, I guess I don't have any good answers. Is it okay for me to drive around and throw stuff in people's driveways? Well, I guess. Um, <laughs> I, mean, I don't, I don't, want, I, I don't, I don't want to encourage you. <laughs> I mean, I don't think this is an issue that the city has any jurisdiction over, yeah. I guess is what I'm saying. It's kind of like, it's, it's also the junk mail. I mean, no, I know, but like we get junk mail. It's incredible. And, and we have to get, you know, we recycle it. Um, so I'm not sure it's a whole lot different than that, except it's on your driveway. So you have to pick it up off your driveway. I have to pick it up out of our mailbox. Um, I guess the only well, suggestion. I've had, I've had, I'm sorry. Yeah. Uh, That's okay. <laughs> sorry. I've had times when it's been thrown and it snows and then just covered and the snowfall comes and I, scatters throughout. Yeah. Um, Why don't you call the Star Tribune I'm do that. And, and complain? I'm going to go pound sand. Um, <laughs> I'm going to see if I can find out if the city could, you know. Okay. Somehow they have permission to do it. My recommendation. Well, no, no one's ever told them they can. They should be able to give you the name. If it's Star Tribune, they should be able to give you the name of the carrier. Uh, personally contacting him should solve it. At least it would in our area. All right. So before I'll, I'll go ahead and check that. Out. Okay. If they say, "Oh, no problem," I apologize for coming here. No, no, no. That's yeah. Um, but thank you for for bringing that up, and thank you for recycling. So. Um, all right. Um, next is consent agenda items, um, and I'm going to ask that we pull number item 4C. That's uh, approved claims. Otherwise, are there any other ones that need to be pulled? Yes, I, I'd like to pull E and F. E is approved repair and view shed setback and approved consent to the acquisition of 7300 Halstead. So that would leave us with A, approve our work session meeting minutes from June 18th, 2018, approve our regular meeting minutes from June 18th, 2018, um, resolution to approve appointment of election judges for the 2018 primary and general elections, and that will do us for now. Is there a motion to approve A, B, and D? So moved. Is there a second? Second. Okay, motion has been made by Mr. Trumplin and seconded by <coughs> Ms. Shannon. Um, Bruce, sorry. <laughs> um, all those in favor signify with aye. 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 All those opposed, motion passes 4-0. So we'll go uh, first with the claims. I pulled this uh, because I believe Mr. Baroni wanted to um, make some comments on one of the claims. Yes, I do, Mayor. Generally, this is the point of the meeting where the Council pull stuff, but I asked the mayor to pull that on my behalf. So, on, and, and this is going to tie into an issue I was going to bring up under staff reports, which I will just get out of the way in addition to um, why I'm pulling that item. There's an item on there, on, it would be on page 14 of the 16 page claim. It's also page 31 overall. It's a change order for or I'm sorry, it's a pay voucher for $31,000 approximately to RAM construction. Um, what you didn't see on the council meeting tonight, the agenda was a change order for 88,000. We took that off and that will come back at a future time. But I also would like to, like, I, like the mayor mentioned, remove this pay voucher for $31,000. Uh, on this pay voucher, it's, I would say 23,000, a little bit over, um, is for work that has been done and probably should be paid, but um, Ram Construction had until, correct me if I'm wrong, Mr. Hornby, till sometime today to authorize that, sign it, and they have not. Uh, there is one item um, of the mix of items that is on that pay voucher that's roughly $7,800 for a retaining wall that wasn't really done to the specifications as required in the Halstead Road project by Ram. And so we are going to just reject the whole item and just bring it back at a different date. Um, how this ties in, as people on the council will probably are probably aware of, that we haven't had the, I would say, the best of luck so far with our Halstead Road project. Um, and so on thurs Thursday of last week, which was July 12th, we sent a letter. Uh, it was signed by Mr. Hornby, but it was worked on by myself and uh, the attorneys at 
Kennedy and Graven, um, basically notifying RAM that we want them to immediately employ the resources necessary to bring the um, Halstead Road project to completion at the earliest possible time. They, um, we asked them that by July 16th, which is today, and I believe we got an email today that said they're working on it, so it'll probably arrive tomorrow. But we gave them a deadline today to give us a revised schedule that would be approved by our engineer to finish the project. As you know, uh, they had a couple of uh, completion dates that they were trying to hit along the progress or lack thereof for this particular project. One was uh, at the end of October of last year for substantial completion and then final completion was to be done by June 30th and they've missed both of those deadlines. Um, so in the letter we, we informed them that we are, um, there are uh, liquidated damages that are accruing currently. Right now the dollar amounts in the $37,000 range. It's probably gone up a few days since this letter was sent because it's a $500 a day liquidated damages. And what we're asking them to do is to, under the rights that we have in the contract, to let us see the revised schedule so they can tell us how they're going to uh, try to finish this project even though it's late. Um, this is not really what I envisioned this project ending up being like, but this, nonetheless, this is where we're at. I know that uh, not only myself and Mr. Grimm, but uh, the attorneys and uh, the engineers have been working and our public works people have been working with RAM kind of almost on a daily basis, trying to get some issues resolved, especially lately. Um, but we felt as if we needed to kind of preserve all our contractual obligations and options by informing RAM uh, with this letter that, um, you know, we kind of mean business now that we have to, and we would like to find out what they plan on doing. Uh, next steps, I guess you can leave it up to your imagination, but uh, nonetheless, we're uh, quite unhappy with what's happened to date, and so we thought we'd let them know since they missed those two deadlines, and, and we'll, I guess we'll anticipate their um, reply to us uh, tonight or tomorrow morning. <coughs> so. so I wanted to kind of tie that into the Keep pay voucher updated. and mm -hmm. tie that in to the change order. Um, we have legitimate reasons for denying payment to them both uh, on both those particular items, but that's why I wanted to pull that pay voucher off the uh, claim so we didn't pay that and kind of give a mixed message to them that you know, mm -hmm. we, we want them to finish. We'd be happy to pay them for work that's been done uh, as a majority of that pay voucher is, but they still haven't uh, completed all the items on, on that, so. Okay. Questions? Do we have penalties that are kicking in now? Mm -hmm. That's the liquidated damages, uh, council member. So that's a $500 a day that they, beyond the, the, the um, completion dates that is accruing for that. So it's the, the meter is ticking. So what's the normal legal procedure then? We net the payment? I don't know what the legal procedure is on it, but yeah, that was essentially what we yes. do once we get to the okay. end. Hopefully there'll be an end with them. So. <laughs> That's, that's what we're trying to figure out. Can okay. we finish the project? Okay. All right. So um, we don't need to take action on that, but nope. we do need to take action on, on the claims. So um, I entertain a motion to approve the claims um, uh, less the RAM um, claim of $31,016.65. With that removed, I should say. So moved. Okay. Is there a second? Second. Okay, um, Mr. Mallater got that one. So Ms. Uh, Bruce made the motion and Mr. Mallater second to approve the claims as presented with the exception of the RAM excavating one for $31,016.65. Any further questions or discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor signify with aye. 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 All those opposed, motion passes. So next we move on to um, the view shed setback variance at 4656 Palmer Point Road. And Ms. Bruce, you wanted that pulled? Yeah, and I, I don't have a problem with the variance. I think it, it, it's legitimate and it should be granted as the Planning Commission requested. But um, I just had a question. I'm trying to understand how much um, it, on page 41, number five at the bottom of the page, it says the applicant is responsible for all fees incurred in review of this application. I'm just trying to get a sense of how much they have to pay for this variance to be processed. 
Um, that, that goes for any legal or engineering review that was done with, with it. Um, mm -hmm. I don't have those costs to date. Um, I, I, we didn't send it to engineering for review, so there'd be no cost there. Um, I, didn't, I didn't send it to Ron. Right. So, um, so there's just a standard approval of a variance fee? Or what is the fee that they pay? Well, the, the fees is, is as such, if, if, if the attorney or the engineer were going to get involved in the situation, it's to cover those fees. Oh, okay, so they're not going to have to pay anything on this. Well, they had to pay for the application, the land use application. It's a, a variance is a $300 application. And a $300 that's my question. Yeah. Okay. That, that's, yeah. I think, what she was trying oh. to get at. Yeah. Yep. Okay, so $300. Yeah. Yep. Okay. Thanks. Okay, any other questions? Otherwise, the, the Planning Commission is uh, recommending approval. Is there a motion to approve the repair and view shed setback variance uh, for 4656 Palmer Point Road? So moved. Okay, is there a second? I'll second. Okay, a motion has been made and seconded. Mr. Molitor made the motion and Ms. Bruce seconded. All those in favor signify with aye. 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 All those opposed? Motion passes 4-0. And also then, Ms. Bruce, for the acquisition of the 7300 Holstead Drive by Three Rivers Park District. Yes, um, my question is, what, what are we looking? For? How much is it going to cost? It's not going to cost us anything. No, the Three Rivers is buying it. The Three Rivers Park District. Okay, okay. Yeah, it doesn't cost us. So why are we approving? Any time the Park District purchases property within the City of Minnetrista, we actually have to approve it. Um, right. Okay. So, okay. yeah. Yeah, Mad Madam Mayor, Council, that's exactly right. There's a statutory requirement or limitation on the park district that if they're buying property in uh, an incorporated city, they need the consent of the city council. So all we're doing is giving them the okay to go out and buy the property. Okay. okay. In this, I don't know if you I were on the council. Yeah. That was yeah. Yeah, it, we, it was the same when they purchased the Kutcher property or, the, or MCWD. Anytime a, an, uh, another entity, put it this way, non-taxpaying entity purchases property within our city, it, they have to get approval from the council. Okay, thanks. Okay, any other questions? Otherwise, is there then a motion to approve um, Consent to the acquisition of 7300 Halstead Drive by Three Rivers Park District for the purpose of a future regional trail. So moved. Okay, is there a second? Second. Okay. All those in favor signify with aye. 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 All those opposed? Motion passes 4 0. Oh. So next we have our business items. Our first business item is Ordinance Number 454, regulating the use of motorized golf carts within the city. And I believe, um, Chief Falls, you'll, you will take this one. Uh, All right. Excuse me. Um, Madam Mayor, members of the council, uh, this is essentially just a slated for a discussion tonight. Um, so I'll just get started and work through this. I'm not going to work in the order of my staff report, so I apologize if that's a little confusing. Um, you can certainly ask questions as we go through. But So with that said, uh, in recent years, we've had a number of uh, requests from citizens or residents, if you will, in, and developers to uh, essentially amend our recreational vehicle ordinance, which currently prohibits the operation of, of motorized golf carts uh, on city streets. And so the requests had been to amend the ordinance so that it would allow the, uh, the operation of motorized golf carts. Um, and so with that, uh, over the years we've kind of taken, because our ordinance currently prohibits it, it's been one of those things that uh, we don't see a lot of, but we know it's happening. Um, we don't get a lot of complaints, but uh, if and when we have, uh, it's only been enforced on a complaint only basis. And so uh, that's worked fairly well, but we're starting to see more and more of these developments that have uh, association areas, clubhouses, association docks, if you will. And so they're, they're heavily utilized to move small children, coolers, equipment from homes down to association areas and dock areas and things of that nature. And so with that, we're seeing an increase in the amount of requests for uh, an amendment to our ordinance that would allow it. Uh, we're starting to see more and more of this type of activity in, in other cities as well, so it's becoming more common. And state statute does allow cities to pass an ordinance that essentially allows for the operation of motorized golf carts through a permit process. And so with that, 
Uh, we fairly recently received, uh, and I don't know if I have the terminology right, but a request from a developer, specifically Woodland Cove. Uh, there is a process where people can fill out an application, and there's a process for that. That developer did, in fact, do that and submitted it to the city. That's why this item is back here tonight. Um, again, this is just a discussion tonight. Um, and so I think the theory is that that's a very, very large development with association properties, the clubhouse, docks, and things like that. Uh, and there's a lot of uh, space between the homes or distance between a lot of the homes and those association areas. And so I think the, that request specifically was an attempt to uh, be able to market the fact that you can in fact purchase a, a golf cart and be able to travel to these common areas uh, fairly quickly and easily and it would be legal to do so because I think the developer was getting questions from potential buyers saying hey do you guys allow this and well, other cities some other cities do and so um, that that uh, request was processed that developer probably most importantly it was explained that there's a cost associated with amending an ordinance um, and so in the past we've I know we've had this discussion many times over the past years uh, and it was decided in those cases just to let it be and continue on the way we were. I think we've received a number of additional requests and, and in this case, the developer is willing to pay for uh, the, the uh, related legal fees uh, if the council chooses to amend our current recreational vehicle ordinance to allow for the operation of motorized golf carts. So essentially it'd be no cost to the city. Um, okay. So with that in your packets, I don't have the page number, uh, Andy, but there is uh, essentially a draft uh, amended recreational vehicle ordinance which now uh, has language that would allow for the operation of motorized golf carts on city streets. Um, as we work through this process, uh, it's not exactly, uh, we, there's a lot of uh, issues or uh, variables that, that probably should be discussed. Uh, I think at a staff level, we've been able to narrow down the vast majority of them. Um, and so I think what I'm gonna do is I have uh, an email that has some items that we thought maybe should be discussed here and uh, from the city attorney. And so I think what I'll do is I'll just go through those. There's not a ton of them. So again, stop me at any time. If you have questions, I'd be happy to answer them. Um, so one of the items is, let me back up just a little bit here. So this ordinance essentially would uh, allow for the operation of motorized golf carts again on city streets only that's the only authority the city has it would be to a grant to grant operation on their own streets um, and there's a there's a number of stipulations that are I guess common language if you will uh, and some of the questions that we would like to I guess receive some direction on include uh, one of the items that varies a little bit from city to city is the age of operation uh, state statute allows for people that are between the ages of under 18, uh, starting at age 14, to operate either a snowmobile or ATV if they have a safety certificate. Mm -hmm. um, there isn't a safety certificate, per se, for golf carts. Oh, okay. <laughs> um, the language put into this draft ordinance was 14 simply because it matches up with the ATV and, and snowmobile. Uh, I guess my recommendation would be if we choose to leave it that way, I, I'm a fan of consistency because it's easier to enforce. Um, but I think if we're gonna leave it at eight, or 14 rather, uh, we might wanna add the requirement that they be with someone who's 18. Otherwise, we could adjust that to 16 because at 16 you can get a valid driver's license, which would be the requirement for, for adults, so. I think with snowmobiles, the reason they have it at 14 is because you can go through the, the course and get a certificate. Correct. Whereas, and yeah, and whereas golf carts, there is no such thing. So, and and if they're driving on streets, no, no, not in the ditches, whatever. They're right on the street. I I think they're gonna. I, my opinion is 16 for right. safety issues, but that's just my opinion. I would agree. I don't know if others have. Or comments, that they have. My recommendation would be to change that to age 16 with a valid driver's with a valid license. license. Yeah, I mean. Yes. Oh, is it? Wait, wait a minute. Is it? 16 or with a valid driver's license? Well, I would say 16 and a valid driver's license. Okay, well then you don't need 16. Right? Sure. You just valid yeah. driver's license. Well, you could say that, but. Yeah. Well, no, because if they're, if they're 18, let's say, but don't have a driver's license, are you gonna say they can't? 
Well, that's what we just said. Well, technically speaking, I think you should have a valid driver's license. If you, right. if you don't, you shouldn't be operating it regardless of your right. age. Okay, so, so you're saying. So we couldn't make it that simple. Okay. That's, that's why I suggested that. Okay. And that's only, that's important because when we come to the permit piece of it, we want to see that someone has a valid driver's license. Right. Okay. If they're a revoked, canceled IPS or, or so on and so forth, we probably right. don't want them driving anything. Right, that's kind of the whole point of sure. revoking their license. Sure. Now, if you give them a missing <laughs> boat, they just get a golf cart and you know, they drive 10 miles. You know, right. So that valid okay. point. Thank you. Uh, one of the other uh, items that was identified as we worked through this process was uh, identifying or designating streets where the operation of golf carts would be allowed. So there's a couple of ways to do that. The city council can literally designate streets by name and pick the streets they think should be included. Um, a lot of cities use uh, criteria like it needs to be a residential neighborhood with a speed limit of no greater than 30 miles an hour. Um, I guess for a talking point on this one, I think if there's a large difference between operating a motorized golf cart in a residential neighborhood such as Hunter's Crest, Turtle Creek, or Woodland Cove, where it's, a, it's purely residential and the highest speed limit in there is 30 miles an hour, as opposed to something like a Halsted Drive or Highland Road where it's not really a neighborhood and the speed limits are higher, they're 40 miles an hour. I think 40 miles an hour is our highest speed limit on city streets. Um, the only thing is, is um, I do know um, one instance on Halstead where somebody was driving a golf cart and that's kind of what the discussion had uh, revolved around about a year and a half ago. Um, and I would hate to say, well, okay, now everybody else in the city can, but if you live on Highland or you live on Halstead, you can't. Um, that's, right, and I'm not, yeah. I'm not saying that. Yeah. I was just using those roads as an example. Right. There's, there's a lot of difference between a, a neighborhood and, sure. and a road. Uh, just a road going to and from, you know, there really isn't anything off of that road. You have to go long distance with a much higher speed limit, uh, as an example. Um, the other thing we could do is just designate all city streets and then through the permit process itself we could try and narrow that down although we'd have to have language in the, in the application that would identify some things that if there are things that we want to avoid for safety reasons etc then we would have to um, specifically spell those out. We define already that the, the definition of a golf cart is and I had a question it says used as a means of transportation on standard golf courses. I didn't know what the word standard meant, but that's the second question. The first question would be, what speed do these things go? I mean, on a golf course, they don't go 30, 40 miles. That, that's that's the not a relevant issue, though. Well, I the mean, engine wouldn't allow them. I mean, it, it doesn't go that speed. That's, that's I, right. my understanding and my concern is not how fast the golf course goes, because I don't care if they go 80. My concern is I don't want to have a car going 45 miles an hour and a golf cart going five, because that's a bad combination. I think that's where the concern is, is the clash of speeds. Yes, yeah. that's correct. This has nothing to do with the speed of the golf cart. It's just do you want to mix golf carts okay. driving slowly in right. an area where the speed limit is above 30 miles per And that, hour. that's a major concern that I have, is so. I don't want to see a golf cart going five miles an hour in a 40 mile an hour zone. It, they're too big of a presence. You know, if it's a bike, or a person walking, you know, it's about this wide. Golf cart, you know, you're talking four or five feet wide. You can't easily get around them with a car. And that, that's why I think the speed concern is, is so important. Well, then we got a concern because the slowest speed in the city is 30. So even in Woodland Cove or those, it's a 30. Right. So if you got a There's golf cart There's a couple that are 25. <laughs> Right, right. Not very many. I think we asked mm -hmm. before we wanted one. Mm -hmm. but, uh, <laughs> right. but so you got an issue there. Right. It, it's, it, absolutely. Okay. Absolutely. Right. And, and this variable, it does vary quite a bit from city to city. Uh, in the research that I did, personally, there, there are a number of cities that have this. Some are much more restrictive and they spell things out, and others are a lot less restrictive and they don't spell a lot. So um, that's really ultimately up to you whether or not we want to designate certain roads or certain types of neighborhoods or the speed limit of the roadway. Um, I just think that uh, that we have to have some language in there that, that does that. So we either allow it everywhere or, or we, we find a way to restrict it. And I think the speed limit of the 
the area makes a lot of sense. I can, I can fully appreciate a developer's wish for to be able to say as a marketing point, selling point, that they allow golf carts in the development. But I'm not sure that that's a valid reason for the city to change something that's been working for it for so long. And how many requests do we normally get to have an ordinance that allows golf carts? Because if, if we already, if we're already making them illegal and we only enforce them if there's a, we enforce that if there's a complaint and that's been working fine, I'm not sure it's a valid role for the city council to help a developer just because he wants a marketing point for his development to change something. Even if he is willing to change the ordinance, I think requiring a permit process and all the people that have golf carts to come and register and get permits and then dealing with all the ramifications of where are they gonna drive and speed limits and all of that, I think that's, it's, I'd like to bring the conversation back up to the level of do we really need to do this and is this a valid role for us to be in? I had the same concern before in to jump in, but once I heard the initial part of the conversation, I think once I think the developer there's a process for them to formally request this and right. pay the fee, right. and then we don't have a choice. Yeah. Then we have to actually well, we don't have to pass it, we don't have to pass it, but we no. actually have to listen to it. Oh, sure, right, sure, sure, right. sure. Right. But I think I, I do agree with your point exactly, though. But I think we do have to go through it because they have made a formal request mm -hmm. to say that. But I, no, I'm, I'm not saying we shouldn't talk about it. I, I, one I, of the, I, I totally agree with you, though. One of the things we could do is, like you said, we could still continue to operate like we do throughout the city, except we could designate, if maybe, I don't know, I'm just thinking out loud, maybe designate the, the, all of the streets in Woodland Cove. And then that way, Woodland Cove residents know that they legally can ride around in Woodland Cove. And they're new and they want to do that, so then they wouldn't hopefully you object to coming in and getting their permit, but then the rest of the community, you can kind of do, I don't know, kind of do the same as we have been, where it's on a complaint basis only. Is it? I, is I know the, it's kind of odd, it, but. Is it possible to have the Homeowners Association govern those no. rules? It's city government? streets, no. that's uh, the problem, yeah. Madam Mayor and Council, uh, these are all very, very valid points, and I, I just want to go back to the point that, uh, that, that was made just a minute ago about uh, how we got to this point. So right. there is a process, I, I apologize, I don't understand the, or the terminology, but the developer did fill out whatever that paperwork was, submit it, and so that's how we ended up here. Right. That isn't the only person that's made this request because we have a number of neighborhoods just off the top of my head over the years, like Jennings Cove has um, deeded lake access or association lake access, Bayside Lane. Um, well, we've got roughly tw 20 multiple dock permits that you got, that we approve every year. Yes. Every one of those, they drive golf carts to those mm -hmm. docks. Absolutely, and they've been doing it for Trillium, years. Trillium, Palmer Point, Palmer just, you know, Point. you're on the list. They all yeah. have been doing it for yeah. right. years. And so I've seen, you know, every probably several a year where they make a request and then they think, well, it's not the end of the world because nobody seems to care as long as no one's complaining, okay, fine. Um, could that change? Certainly could. I think the usage of this type of transportation is, is much more than it was. This ordinance has been, the current ordinance has been in place for years. Um, so the question is, do we, do we need to change it? Do we want to change it? Are we at a point where we should change it? I think even if we were to allow it in Woodland Cove, that would still require uh, an ordinance Changing. amendment. Right, it would. So regardless of whether we go right. beyond that or not. Well, here's the other question, and I think maybe to Ms. Um, Bruce's point, I think the issue is having to get a, a license or a permit and going through that process. However, am I correct? If you make this an ordinance by law, you have to require them to get a permit? Yes. See, that's the, that's the catch. The statute says yeah. very specifically that if yeah. the city ordinance allows it, it has to be done by permit. Yeah. So actually, by not enforcing it, we're at, yeah, it's, it's kind of, it's not a, <laughs> I don't know. Madam Mayor, Council, though, you know, the, the other perspective, I guess, is that 
there are actually people who want to comply with the law. Right. And right. when you do this sort of wink and nod, we're not going to really go after you, it sort of puts those people in an awkward position because mm -hmm. then they're not complying with the law. Then the other question I would have too is if there were an accident, okay, let's say currently it's not allowed and there were an accident, would the golf cart owner or driver then be, let's say, more liable because it's illegal and they're doing, they're operating illegally? Well, they very well could be. Uh, certainly if, if there were an accident, especially if there's injuries, then they would be required to contact us. Uh, and certainly that's not legal today. So would that be part of the accident report? Absolutely. So that would, would make it worse for them. Yeah, see, that's um, under what I'm this wondering. amended ordinance, one of the requirements that I would recommend uh, for part of the permit application process is that they provide proof of insurance. They would be required to have some form of insurance on this this golf cart right. if they want a permit because that would essentially cover some or all of any liability that might occur. Yeah. The, um, go going back to the issue of what streets, I think you're making valid distinctions that not all city streets are equal and therefore may not all be appropriate. One thought I had would be to uh, provide in the ordinance that they would be allowed on such streets, city streets, as the council may from time to time designate. And what I'm thinking of is then uh, that would allow the, uh, the staff to come up with a list of appropriate streets, residential streets, um, and amend and have the council perhaps adopt that by resolution and every once in a while as new subdivisions come into existence and new streets get added that that resolution could be updated to include all of the sort of smaller more neighbory residential streets and exclude the the other ones that you're worried about but for instance I'm, I'm thinking uh, West Branch Road very little traffic but yet, I think it's 40 miles an hour, but very little traffic. So are we going to say on West Branch Road you can't, but, and it's a through, it's a connector street. So on West Branch Road you can't, but you, you know what I'm saying? I, I guess I kind of feel like if, I don't know, if you're operating it safely. Well, Madam Mayor, Council, I think that brings up a good question. And one of the thoughts I had as I was reviewing all of this is, do we want to simply allow the operation of golf carts for the sake of allowing it, or do we want to tie it to some purpose? Do you need to have some? I understand the, the, uh, the need or the want for allowing a golf cart to be used to haul your stuff down to your um, dock association area because you've got kids and gear and things like that. There's a purpose for it versus just driving up and down the street for the sake of being able to do it. Um, I think there's a big difference between the two. And but so that gets into an enforcement issue. Because then you have to ask them, why are you driving your golf cart? <laughs> Correct, but to the point that uh, Mr. Beatty made, yeah. uh, I think if staff were to come up with a, a list of designated streets, if you will, uh, I think uh, from my standpoint, I would probably uh, turn to, to Mr. Abel and say, well, where are our association dock areas and, and areas that have association oh, pools, clubs, houses, and things like that? Uh, and that would be the starting point from I guess uh, from my perspective that would make sense uh, versus um, up and down West Branch Road I don't know that what would be the point of that other than maybe it's fun uh, you're not going to your dock you're not going to your association you could be going to the golf course yeah there's a golf course there for a while that's the only <laughs> golf course in the same good point there is although I wouldn't want to go down that hill on a golf course no I wouldn't either but I'm just saying what's your point well okay she's going to the golf course so well, and, and, well never mind that yes. <laughs> we, we have people in, in my neighborhood that have golf carts that just I, there's a guy with his dog that you've probably seen that, that every day he just drives up and down Fielding Trail and Game Farm and down Kingswood and sure. it's just for recreation so I, I, I think it's, it's an area where the city doesn't need to go. If, if, if we're not seeing accidents or complaints increasing, um, I, I don't see the, ne the necessity of doing anything at this point. I think things are working pretty well right now and it, a developer can say 
people use them and it's enforced on a complaint basis and that's how it is here. Sure, I, I think, uh, like I said, this is just uh, simply being presented because we had the request um, mm -hmm. and I'm just kind of presenting the information as it's uh, been given to me and, and I really don't, uh, I think to Ron's point or Mr. Beatty's point, it does feel a little odd that we know there's a lot of usage going on and it's technically not allowed. Um, and that's kind of a point that the more that occurs, the, the odder it feels. It just feels like it's something that at some point we need to address. Whether that's now or, or later, I don't know. It, but if we have someone willing to pay for it, it seems to make sense that we would, we would do something with this now. Um, <laughs> But then, but that's ultimately and, and I kind of, I, I understand um, what Ms. Bruce is saying, and I, I don't disagree, actually. I, but then, in my opinion, you'd have to allow it on every street, on every city street, because yeah. I, I don't think it would be fair to say to the guy on Game Farm Road, well, you can't drive there now anymore. You know what I'm saying? After mm -hmm. the ordinances. Because it's a through street, and, it's, and ca there's a lot of cars or whatever. When, when he's doing it now. Um, right, well, illegally, but he's doing it now. Well, but then he'd still fall under the current. Right, so nothing would change for him because he's, right. technically it's not legal right. now. So. Right. So and I'm, I'm all for letting, think if, if it's not a problem, we should, I, I'm for freedom. And if our residents want to have the freedom of driving their golf carts and they're, not, and they're doing it safely, and I think they should be able to do that. Well, then you should change the ordinance. Then we have to so. change the ordinance. See, that's what they're right, getting that's at. Why we're here. But, but I'm saying in, until we see that there are complaints that people are not driving safely and not... Mayor and Council, that was the one thing I was going to throw in here. So let's say it's this year, maybe next year. We get somebody who get a complaint, cops go out and tag them, and they come in here and complain to the council, how come I got a ticket? Everybody else is doing it. I hope you back up the cops. Absolutely, but and if, if people if speed it all the time, it's yeah, the same thing. It's the same thing as a speeding ticket. It's a speeding ticket. Yeah, yeah. I'm just saying. And that's, that's the same thing to the point about. But I, I don't think we've uh, issued a citation yet that's yeah, been a ticket. Dollar amount, dollar paid yeah. ticket. I think they've been warnings. I, I'm not aware of any tickets that oh, have been okay. issued for this. We've had so so. It's been we've, we've given a couple people warnings over the years right. that uh, were and operating illegally, okay. and that's especially that's those that weren't driving it correctly or safely or what have you. Then you're being consistent as yeah. far as that. Right. Right. Okay. Yeah. And that's kind of the same point about the um, people not feeling about right about it. It's like, well, we see more and more of it. It's just like speeding. We see more and more of it too. And it's kind of the same, same analogy. But the the police have have a um, way of um, uh, counteracting that. They have they a way to counteract golf course right now. Well, yeah, they could. But usually, people getting speeding tickets aren't getting them based on a complaint. They're getting them because they're going too fast. Right. And the cop caught them. Right. We do actively enforce speed. It's just we can't. We we right. physically can't stop all of them. There's right. just so many that right. you can only do as much as you can do with the staff you have. But ultimately, it's it's uh, your pleasure, and and so. Right. So. My belief would be if we're going to create the ordinance, it has to be for everybody, not just ear tagged. I don't think it can be because then you're going to have to keep modifying it. So we have a new development or, or uh, something else comes up and then we're back to, well, we've got to add that into the ordinance. I think it has to be somehow written so everybody has to meet the requirements. They have to buy a tag, uh, the fee is X, and the tag has to be displayed on the vehicle a certain way. It has to have certain safety equipment. So you're, you're going to have to build a lot into it. And I don't know, again, Mr. Molitor's comment about you know the speed on the road and the golf cart on the road, uh, they're not a good mix right now and won't be even if they're on a side street. Well, if you go to Arizona and some of these um, retirement communities, there's high speed traffic with golf carts. I mean, it, it right. is happening all over. But, but and how are theirs written, I wonder? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. Madam Mayor and Council, if I can just make a couple more points. I think, uh, first of all, a lot of the associations that you're referring to, the retirement communities and so on and so forth, are not private or public roads. 
the private roads, and so that's an entirely different animal that we're talking about here tonight. Right. And I think uh, if, uh, well, let me back up just a little bit. I think uh, the more, we're starting to see more and more of this, and the fact that we aren't getting a lot of complaints, I don't think is really the driving issue. I think this is something that we've obviously had a number of discussions on over the years, and we've kind of chosen to let it go. I think we're starting to see a lot more of the type of developments um, not only are we starting to see more of them, but a lot of them are already there, and the houses are there, and the association buildings and docks and all that are there. So this is happening much more frequently than it was two years ago or four years ago. Mm -hmm. And so I guess I personally am starting to feel like this, it just, there's something about this that makes me feel like we, the police, are being put in a very awkward position right. because we're essentially saying, hey, we know all this is going on and we're just going to turn and look the other way and, and hope that someone doesn't do something bad in a golf cart, crash and get hurt bad or crash into a car or another golf cart. Mm -hmm. And so, so what, what at some point we're going to have to address this. And, and I guess for me, I understand there's cost associated with this. In this particular case, I'm not presenting this because I think we owe anything to any developer for, that isn't the motivation. The motivation is it's something that's occurring, it's gonna occur more and more as time goes on, and this is an opportunity to do it at literally no cost to the city or very little, if any. Um, and then the permit process, the staff time is gonna be covered by the permit fee. So this is, uh, I guess, the perfect opportunity for us to amend our, our recreational vehicle ordinance to allow for this. Um, as you know, it, we can, whatever you ultimately decide, if it gets changed and amended, if something doesn't work, we can tweak it down the road. Um, there's a lot we can do. I just think this is something that's occurring a lot more frequently than it has been, and I don't think it's gonna go away. I think it's gonna get a lot worse. I have a question. What, what, what's the process when you get a complaint from somebody that somebody's driving a golf cart someplace they shouldn't or an underage, like a little kid or something, there's a complaint. What what do you do? Do you do you go and talk to them? And I think Mr. Brony said that you haven't issued any citations or tickets for that yet. Uh, to my knowledge, we haven't. Like I said, we don't get a lot of complaints. The complaints that we do get or have gotten typically stem around two things. First, it's really young people driving these things, mm -hmm. kids that probably shouldn't be driving a motorized anything, or at least not off their own property. Uh, and the second one would be someone just driving carelessly. Um, if you want someone to complain, do one of those two things and they're going to call. And then we're going to go and hopefully catch them doing it and then we'll take action. If, in the case of that, I, I can remember a couple with fairly young children driving golf carts. Um, we had the parents come and get them or, or we went and talked to the parents and that was the end of that. We haven't had any more issues with it. Um, and then the careless one or, or two, again, there haven't been a lot, fortunately, because most people are pretty smart and they understand that if they do that, people are going to call. If you if you drive these things respectfully and quietly, probably not gonna call, but that, that may change as the numbers of these things in, increase. Regardless of whether, whether we have an ordinance or not, the, the means by which you catch people, do you foresee that being that patrols would catch people and ticket them, or are you still gonna rely on complaints coming in for the, the that, That's a great question. I, I think. You know, it's just like any other crime or violation, if you will. Uh, a lot of it is done by patrol. Um, it really depends on the location, the time of day, and things like that. Um, but complaints are a big, big amount of our calls, uh, are complaint driven. So um, we're still going to, that pro same process is it's still going to play gonna out. It's probably going to be the same. We're just going to have some ability to do something about it. it the, the bottom line is, even if the ordinance is amended to allow for them to operate these things, if they're doing something like driving carelessly, that's an offense that we can, you know, not only revoke the permit, but we can issue a citation for, depending on the level of whatever they're doing. And you can't is issue a citation now? Yes, we can now. You can? Yes. Now we can just, we could literally issue a citation now for the mere operation of this thing mm -hmm. on a city street today. Right. Uh, it doesn't have to be careless or anything like that. If we see them, we could literally stop them and give them a ticket because it's not allowed at all today. I think strictly prohibited. To that point, to that point, the point you made earlier about the, one of the things I like the way it's it is now is that people that, that do know that it's illegal, uh, they, they know they have to be on their best behavior or they are going to have a problem. 
I think once you start giving people the permit, mm -hmm. they start getting a sense of entitlement that, hey, I've got my permit and by golly, I paid my whatever, 50 bucks, 100 bucks to get this permit and I'm going to drive down the road and be a jerk about it. And, and I think by having this here as it is written now, you don't have that sense of entitlement. And so it kind of keeps people honest, if you will. Uh, about their behavior. Doesn't keep them honest because it's illegal. No, I keep them honest about their behavior. You know, once you once you start getting into something where they have the right to do it, people get a little more flagrant and and disrespectful. Well, that, here's here's where I'm coming from. I I totally get kind of the the freedom of doing things, um, but our chief is absolutely correct. There's a lot more golf carts in our city, on our city streets today than there was, you know, five years ago or 10 years ago. In fact, you never saw a golf cart. 10 years ago, I don't think you even saw golf carts on the road anywhere. Um, so it is becoming an issue for the police officers when they see something and they know it's violating um, our ordinance, but they really kind of have to go wink, wink, turn the other way. That is an issue for our police officers, and it may become an issue for insurance reasons, not for us, but for the drivers of the vehicles and the drivers of the golf carts. So if there were an accident between a golf cart and a, and a car, and that golf cart is not insured, that could be, that, there could be some huge issues there. So that's, so I'm not, I, I'm in favor of something. I want to be very loose about the ordinance and make it very as make make it as minimal as possible. But um, unfortunately, and if if we could, which unfortunately it doesn't sound like we can, if we could make it where you don't have to apply for a permit, you just have to meet these certain requirements. I would that that would be great. But I don't know that we can do that. Um, that's the unfortunate thing. Um, now the other thing is you could enact or you could adopt an ordinance and then you could still wink wink if they don't come in for a license <laughs> you know i don't know how you enforce that then yeah. well we don't want to enforce it anyway <laughs> well no i mean okay so let's say we change the ordinance we have a, a permit process now well now you pretty much have to stop everybody to see if they have a permit don't why you? We well don't the permit would be anything now you don't do well, it what's now. What's the difference? Yeah. The, the permit would be displayed similar to the one mini truck permit that we issue every year, but it's very clear on the vehicle. And I think, uh, to a point, I don't remember who made it, but I'll, I'll say this: you know, five years ago or <coughs> so, I can't remember the last time you drive around and see a golf cart operating on a city street. Today, it's very difficult on a nice summer day during those hours when people are moving about to drive through Trillium or. I don't know about Woodland Cove, but Trillium and some of the other neighborhoods that have uh, association dock areas right. and not see a golf cart. So it makes it really awkward when you're driving by and they're doing something illegal right in front of you and you're in a fully marked squad in uniform and you just turn them up the other way. And then the neighbor calls in a, a, a dog at large and uh, you know that is something that we would deal with or or any other crime that we would see and just naturally take enforcement action on. Someone goes, drives through a stop sign, for example. Um, and so the frequency in which this is occurring is, is more, I guess, that I don't know how else to describe it. So the likelihood that our staff is gonna be out there and basically seen doing nothing about something that's obviously not legal is increasing exponentially. But the, the, the point I wanna make though is, is the patrols don't have to look the other way. They, they can issue a citation if they want to. If they see something dangerous, they can issue a citation. And, that's and I keep hearing that they have to look the other way, and they don't. Well, if they start issuing citations for every golf cart that they see on the road, we're no, going to have... No, for, for dangerous activity. But, if, but, if somebody's... Well, well the violation the now violation is simply is the simply operation. On the road. So it doesn't require any level of danger. I, I understand that. So, so they do have to look have to the other way. If we saw it, even being operated safely, we would have to stop it because it's a violation. If a golf cart is being operated unsafely today, you're telling me that you can't no, no. issue a citation? No, if it's operated unsafely today, we would stop it. What I'm saying is the ordinance currently says they cannot operate it. So if it goes by us on the road operating safely and we look the other way, we're just simply allowing it to be a violation that drives right by us. 
I guess I'm not understanding right. your question. I'm, I'm saying if somebody is operating a golf cart unsafely, you're, you, you can issue a citation yeah, to absolutely. stop yes. them. Absolutely. Correct. Right. So why do we need a new ordinance? I think you put the police in a very difficult situation by continuing mm -hmm. to have this illegal but ask the police to, to turn a blind eye. I mean, I just think that mm -hmm. makes them make decisions that really are not good for them to have to, to, uh, to do. And if there's widespread use and everyone knows it's illegal and, you, and you're telling the police not to enforce it except in extreme cases, that says to me you don't really care that it's, that it's illegal. I mean, you don't care that people uh, are, are using it or are doing that. So why continue to make it illegal? Well, I could say the same thing about short-term rentals. We, we had that same conversation about short-term rentals and looking the other way and not enforcing that ordinance. I mean, no, we would enforce do that all it. The time. Oh. Well, it's a complaint-driven right. thing. Right. And, and that there's an ordinance, and it's a complaint-driven ordinance. So, um, I mean, it's I like I said, it. I understand where you're coming from. I just think that. Again, I'm just coming from the perspective of we. It, it's okay. For instance, we had a gentleman that was burning some brush in his backyard after a storm, and uh, it wasn't a very big fire, but um, he, his neighbor called and complained, and therefore he had to extinguish it. Well, you know, what if what if a neighbor sees a golf cart going down the road and doesn't like that person? and says, I'm gonna call and complain about that. And then the police have to go out and enforce it, even if they're driving safely. So that's the other issue. Do you wanna put people in a situation that they're actually operating illegally? I mean, that's, that's the question. I don't see that situation any different. No, the question is, the do we want to put our res the police on his neighbor no, what and I'm say that he was speeding? speeding. I know, whatever. but what I'm saying is that do we want to put our residents in a situation, and this is a question, do we want to put our residents in a situation where they are operating illegally? Is, well, that, is that what you want to do? That's okay. the question. Here, here's a somewhat parallel. The speed limit on the street that I live on is 20 miles an hour. I could count in the 10 years, I've 12, 13, however many years I've been there, I could count on one hand the number of times I've seen cars drive 20 miles an hour or less. Sure. And so we allow everyone to, and so in that case, you know, in right or wrong, the, the residents are, are, you know, you're putting them in a position that if they want to get to the end of the street, and they're prob and in a normal course of business, they're going to be violating the law. So in that case, you to make the parallel, you should say, well, maybe we should have the speed limit to 35. That way, not everyone's breaking the law. Is that a good idea? I don't know. I don't think so. And that's kind of the same thing here. It's, it's just because everyone's. Uh, it's. Just, um, well, I'm just saying. No, I, I understand. Right Madam Mayor and Council, if I could just make another comment here. I, I while I understand the point you're trying to make, I don't think that. Because the speed limit is posted at 20, that I think the argument actually means the opposite to me. I think uh, that isn't the city allowing them to speed. They're choosing to speed. So I think that is the opposite argument in my, from my perspective. But um, they're choosing to violate the golf cart ordinance. Correct. And so I think getting back to the, the point of how we got here, yes, we got a request. It wasn't just that. And maybe I played too heavy on that point alone. but. One of the things we do all the time as a city when we review ordinance is we certainly review ordinances that get a lot of uh, comments or questions or it comes up all the time. And, and we look very closely at those ordinances. And this is one of them that comes up all the time and is coming up with greater and greater frequency. Uh, this isn't something that we haven't heard a thing about for years and we just out of the blue because one person asked for it, we decided, hey, let's take a look at this. This is something that's been going on, it's going on, it's continuing to go on more and more, and so that's how we got to this point. And I just think at some point, we are going to have to address this uh, on some level. So I'd like to suggest that perhaps we keep track of the complaints that are coming in and see how many we get over the next year, and keep track of the requests and and see a year from now if if it 
might be something to reconsider. Well, not not just um, complaints, <coughs> but um, inquiries about um, golf carts. Are they allowed? I mean, oh, because sure. um, and uh, <coughs> so then then the other thing to keep in mind at that point, if you if the council decides they want to make an ordinance change, that'll be on our nickel then, not on the developers. So that's, that's the other thing to consider. And it, it's possible that the developer a year from now may want to do the same thing. Um, so okay. going back to the liability issue for a minute. So if we permit these, permit golf carts on the street, and there's an accident involving a, a car, truck, motorized vehicle that's a licensed vehicle, to me this seems like there is now a higher standard applied to that motor vehicle because now it wasn't, bef as it's currently written, it's pretty black and white. You're on the road, you're not supposed to be, just by your presence, you're at a very high percentage at fault. Whereas if we change the ordinance and we allow a golf cart, cart now the drivers of the motor vehicles are subject to a much higher level of responsibility because now that's a conforming use for long term, but it, it's, it's allowed and I'm allowed. Now the liability to me looks much more 50-50, whereas currently it looks much more 95-5. If if I'm not sure if that's clear. But I sure. was looking at it more in terms of um, <coughs> if, if it's not insured and there's, there's injuries, who then pays for it? See, uh, so there's in with your insurance coverage, you always pay for uninsured and underinsured motorists, and so um, your insurance, even if you were not at fault, your insurance may end up paying paying the bill. Because and how would that work here? Because underinsured motorist or non-insured motorist, do we even want either apply here? Because it's not, it's, a, it's not a, another motorized vehicle to call for. Well, I'm not an insurance agent. I'm just asking no, the question. No, that's I'm asking the, the, the liability issue here is because I'm not even, if, as a driver of a vehicle, and if I hit one of these here, I'm not even sure if my car <coughs> would, would apply. Well, so, that's something we'd have to ask. Yeah, I think, uh, you know, that's that's certainly a, a, could be a piece of the puzzle. Ultimately, in any accident, we, we report the facts as the police department, and then the insurance companies essentially use whatever formulas they use to determine that. Uh, yeah, as part of the permit process, we would require them to have insurance, um, and it's going to make a big difference. Were they, were they following and driving this thing according to the ordinance with the safety equipment, the insurance, driving it safely and appropriately, or were they you know, driving in complete reckless manner or, or so on and so forth. So there's a lot of variables there that... I mean, again, if you don't want to do it, that's fine, but um, with the permit requirement, they would be required to have slow-moving vehicle, you know, on there. There would be certain safety things that they would have to have, which maybe not all golf carts currently have. So that would it would hopefully improve the safety of operate, operating safety of these of these um, carts. But so two don't want it. Uh, John, where do you, where are you? I can see the pos positiveness of having them permitted. I just don't. I, if we're going to permit them, I think we have to permit them all, not just within a right development right. and I can't see writing into the ordinance well only on these streets because that's going to be a never ending modification going on and then how do we know like my neighbor is one of them that runs down out of our dead end cul-de-sac goes up Kingswood goes down game farm comes in fielding trail where do you draw the line as to how far he right. can go. Right. And then do we have to ask the public <laughs> who has golf carts out there? Where do you go? How do you use them? I think that certainly would be we'd, we'd want, I'd want to know what is, how far reaching is this? Yeah, that's true. Because I truthfully, I don't run around on the roads a lot. Mr. Falls would know a lot more, but I mean, where do you see all these? Maybe heavily in the, these developments, but there are other places that mm -hmm. I know they're running around. Right. I just don't know where. Right. They're, they're not much different than bicycles, actually. What's the difference between why bicycles 
actually go faster than golf carts and we're not permitting bicycles. They can be ridden by children and I don't see, I just, I don't get the need to, to do it. Okay, well, it sounds like we're kind of at a um, standstill. So um, what I'm gonna say is um, we're just gonna have to put it on hold and uh, let the developer kind of know that we're gonna be monitoring this. Uh, maybe we get some, maybe over the course of the next few months, we get some um, more feedback. Um, well, Madam Mayor and Council, the, the, the applicant, I mean, he's paid, he's submitted a land use application. Um, he's paid his fees, he's paid the deposit. You know, Ron's got time into this, so um, obviously, it's, I don't know, it's a split tonight, but I, I'd obviously be fair to uh, probably allow for an official vote when you have a full council with Pam back, um, and also let the uh, applicant who made this request come and uh, give you a synopsis of what he's seen in okay. Woodland Cove, and he's very knowledgeable of um, just the area in general, given his uh, connection to the development community and such, Lake Minnetonka and all, and all of that. Um, I think he's worked on a, a couple other cities that have, have done yeah. ordinances, so he can explain to you more exactly what's going on, why it's a problem in Woodland Cove, um, why people are raising it as a concern. I mean, you know, if you tell somebody okay. it's, it's prohibited, but yet the cops don't do anything, well, people get pretty skeptical uh, of, of that. So um, my suggestion would be to bring it back at uh, another meeting for an official vote, because it, it would have to be voted on. Okay. He made okay. an application, he's paid, he's paid those fees. Um, would the August 6th uh, deadline, be, would that still be a good deadline? Because uh, aren't we under the 60-day rule with the uh, land, a um, land application? Um, yeah, yeah, we're still, we have time. We have okay. Time. Yep. All right. So if not on the 6th, then maybe on the, the second meeting in August, maybe you can talk to Mr. Robinson and find out which date would yep. work for him. Yep. I'd like so. to say something about that. Sure. When we had the vote on the short-term rental, I wasn't able to be here for that vote. And I was told that if it was going to be a swing vote, that maybe they might change the date of, of the vote. But essentially, the council voted that night and well, would be made a, that decision. Okay. And I think there, there isn't any reason to bring this back. Just I think we need to vote on this with the council members that are here tonight. We can certainly do that. I'd like to okay. make a motion to do that. Okay, then what is your motion? I'd like to move that we postpone this for another year and revisit it, keep track of the uh, the complaints coming in and revisit this a year from now. Okay. Is there a second to that? I'll second that. Okay. Um, one of the one of the issues that I have with this is I do agree with David that since there was a land application right. and the applicant should be given an opportunity so this is a little different than the ordinance that we were writing for uh, VRBOs or short-term rentals. So the application was by an applicant, and I think in fairness to the applicant, okay, we should give the applicant an opportunity to at least address the council. And we should give him or them, if it's multiple, an opportunity to talk to us to say, this is why they're doing it, this is what they want, et cetera. I don't think in any other land use application would we just carte blanche say we're not going to listen to the applicant. We would always invite them up and say, does the applicant have anything else to add? But so wasn't this published? The agenda was published and he wasn't, he chose not to come tonight to speak? He, he um, it's, he's under the assumption that you're all okay with this because you turn a blind eye to the current rule and the ordinance. That's a bad assumption. Well, that's a bad assumption for him. Maybe so, but nonetheless, yeah. yeah. Uh, Ron, did you want to? Well, yeah, I think more to the point, If, besides the fairness issue, if we're treating this as subject to the 1599 rule, failure to deny is approval. So continuing it for a year doesn't solve the problem. Okay, say that again, I'm sorry. Well, if, if we're considering this a land use application mm -hmm. subject to statute 1599, which we all know and love in the land use yeah, context, okay. if you don't deny a request within the requisite period of time, it's okay. deemed approved. I will change my motion then to deny the request. Okay, is the second, okay, so your motion is to deny the request to 
um, change golf cart to change the ordinance to add golf carts. Correct. Okay. Is is there is the second, Mr. Chamberlain? Are you okay with that second? Madam Mayor and Council. Um, so. The, the other thing, the, the reason that it came as a discussion tonight, we, as Paul mentioned at the beginning of his meeting, is he wasn't asking the council to adopt it tonight. He was asking for discussion as he was going through the bullet point discussion. list. We are required to put a 10-day notice. This isn't a, a notice we need to publish in the paper because it's not Chapter 5, which is the zoning ordinance. That does require a publication in the newspaper. This requires a 10-day notice uh, on the board out front and on our website, which we have done for the August 6th meeting, thinking we'd have a discussion tonight, get some direction, bring it back to the August 6th meeting for you guys to officially take adoption. So technically we can't because again, it was supposed to be a discussion tonight to get direction on those items that Paul was going through. Okay. So unfortunately we could Take a vote on this. Well, first of all, if you change your motion, the second has to agree to that change. So okay, so I'll make the motion to deny in this or a second. Okay, is it, um, the second was John. So John, I'd have to ask you, are you in favor of denying or are you in agreement with that motion? Or are you withdrawing your second? You I can, would, I'll you, withdraw my second. If this is just discussion, then does there need to be a vote at all? No, but Ms. Ms. Bruce did, but here, hold on. Yeah. You're right, there doesn't have to be any motion, but Ms. Bruce did make a motion, and I have to entertain every motion that's made. That's legal. And she did make a motion, and so uh, if you're withdrawing your second, then I would have to say, is there a second to Ms. Bruce's motion? She's, her motion is to deny this ordinance. Is there a second? Is there a second? I have a question. Okay. So even if there was a second, it, what, what I'm hearing from staff is that it still it, would not it, be a valid. Correct. You can vote. I mean, you can, you can vote, vote, but it's going to have to vote again on the sixth. Right. Well, and it's not. It's it's technically not legal, but we can't. So, is there a second? I'm hearing that there's no second. So what I'm going to recommend. So the motion dies. What I am going to recommend is that Mr. Beatty well, weigh in one more time. <laughs> I, this is getting very convoluted. I mean, I, I think the re for the reasons that David laid out, I don't think you're, you would be in a position to adopt the ordinance tonight. I think you could deny it tonight. Okay. I don't think there's any. I mean, what he cited was the statute that went into effect about a year ago that says if you're going to adopt an ordinance, you need to uh, notify people 10 days in advance. That was not done because it was not intended that this was going to be final action tonight. As everyone's been saying, it's been discussion. Right, okay. But you, if, if there is no interest in going forward and it's gonna take three affirmative votes to approve this, then you could certainly deny it tonight and it would never be brought back. So does that change anything? Otherwise we can bring it back and also have Mr. Robinson here and maybe some other people here too to speak next. I'd be interested in bringing it back. I'd like to hear further discussion from the public if that's what you want, Mr. Robinson. Okay. So. I mean, it, it's kind of a split vote, so. I'll, I'll put the motion back out there to deny. Okay. okay, is there a second? I'll second it. Okay, any further discussion? All those in favor signify with aye. 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 And that's uh, Shannon and uh, that's Ms. Bruce and Mr. Molitor. All those opposed? Nay. Aye. That's uh, two against two, so. That motion uh, fails. That motion fails. Does that automatically make it that it passed? No, no, well, okay. no, no. The motion to deny failed. failed. Right. So we're going to bring it back next time. Um, we'll talk with Mr. Robinson and, and hear some other uh, comments, and then we'll make a decision. We'll revisit it next time. So 
August 6th. Okay. All right. Good discussion. So um, next we have um, approved proposal for the MS4 pond and outfall inspections. Madam Mayor and members of the council, good evening. Uh, in your packet on page 89 is a council memo or a memo to the council that indicates that the <coughs> deadline to have the ponds and the outfalls inspected visually uh, comes up on July 31st. Um, Public Works did indicate they did need some assistance with some of this work, although that's not saying they haven't done some of the maintenance already. But there are 15 city ponds that have to be visually inspected and 54 outfalls. Um, WSB is proposing to do that work on an hourly not to exceed uh, basis for $2,520 plus reimbursable mileage expenses. Uh, and there is also a resolution in your packet, resolution 105-18, that would um, authorize that work. So just a couple um, comments. Um, first of all, on page 91, it says scope of services and it says MS4 pond inspections and uh, ponds must be visually inspected, yada, yada, yada. And then it says MS4 outfall inspections. Uh, 56 outfalls must be visually inspected prior to the expiration of the MS4 permit. A WSB will provide staff members to conduct visual inspections of 15 ponds. So it should say uh, 56 outfalls. It's just that it's the, 15, it's 15 ponds and 56 outfalls. I understand right. that, but here I it's the, the, the ponds is listed twice. So right. the first one should say 15 ponds, the second one should say 56 outfalls. It's, it's right, the second sentence of number two. It, yeah. 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 yeah, okay. So, and then here's another question. Before you do that, can we? No, no, I have another. Hold on just a second. Well, it, it's in the same sentence. It's oh, okay, okay. The, the, the item number two, you say 56 outfalls, but in the memo above, you say 54. Mm -hmm. um, so, it, which one is it? Well, I think, the, I, I think what's happened is Public Works has already done some inspection on some of the outfalls and they've done some work on them. Okay. And so the staff memo, or the, the proposal is based on the total number of outfalls that you have to review. The memo, I think, identifies what's remaining. Uh, but again, that'll, that'll have to be verified by public works. But to, to our knowledge, there's a total of 56. The proposal includes all 56. Okay, thank you. Uh, so then another, my question is this. Um, is, I thought our staff was, uh, public works was going to do this. So why is, so is there some training involved or something? Under this proposal, there wouldn't be any training involved, although I'm not saying we wouldn't um, have them take along with our staff to see how it's done. Okay. Um, but essentially, um, what's happening is with the late spring uh, and the other items they have on line, you know, time is of the essence, so they've asked us to put this together. Be because of the July 31st deadline. Right. Okay, I get that. If, um, and I don't want to, um, I know Gary and his crew are very busy. If there is somebody this year that could tag along and kind of learn the ropes, so to speak, that would be good um, so that we can get somebody trained. So, okay. I just had a question. Um, what is an outfall? An outfall is anywhere that a storm, your storm drainage system discharges. So does it discharge to another pond, then discharge to a wetland? Wetland, does it discharge to a downstream, downstream uh, channel or ditch or those kind of things? That's an outfall. Okay, so the outfalls aren't necessarily in the same location as the ponds? Correct. Okay. Yeah, could, there are areas where you have storm sewer that discharges to a ditch or discharges to another channel somewhere. Okay, thanks. So that doesn't include the inlet, it's only the outlet? Correct. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. Any other questions? I was of the same understanding that you were. Okay. I this was taken on by the no staff. So I think, I think there's a learning curve too. So if, if we can get that accomplished, some, either this time, that would be great. And if not, um, maybe sometime between now and next year, we can get one of our people trained. So, okay. So I do have one more question. Is our, I assume that our swamp software is in a spot now where it can accept the data that we're going to collect from this activity? Well, that's a good question. Um, so these visual inspections also help um, 
identify ponds that have issues. Now, it doesn't survey every pond. It's just as a visual inspection, so we're not going out in a canoe or a boat and checking the depth of certain ponds. However, to answer your question on the swamp from the data we have based on the age of the pond, um, the, uh, the swamp has ranked based on the data that we have the first 15 ponds that should be looked at, the first 10 ponds that should be looked at. And so those are ranked. Once you start going through and looking at these ponds and reviewing them based on the data you have, then you will review them physically. Mm -hmm. Then you can put better data into the program, which will give you an idea. You know, Is that part of this proposal is to put no, the data into the program? No, it's not part of the proposal. So. But it is, it is to document for your, um, for your stormwater pollution prevention plan. That's the purpose of it, to provide that documentation that these have been inspected. Which we need for our MSO, for Correct. our permit. Correct. So Why wouldn't we the, put it into the swamp program? Well, it would be the next step to do that, yes. Okay, good question. But that's also something that your staff can do. Sure. Well, and our staff can do that. So, and, but again, there's going to be some training. There's also an iPad program that we've already set up for them. It's, it, it, um, they, they've already been trained. You know, it's, they haven't been trained on that yet, but they certainly can be. But they're also quite intuitive as well. As well. Okay. All right. Is any other questions then? So we're probably going to have to have another, if we don't have staff time to do this, I can't imagine us having staff time to enter the data into the database. Well, right now what it is is it's not necessarily that we don't have staff time. It's it's the timing of it. I get that we part. might have more staff time, you know, like sometimes um, in the tweener seasons like October, November, when they're not plowing, they're not doing other things, then they might have time to insert the information. So we don't have to put that information today into the system? I get it. I'm just trying to think ahead a little bit here yeah. as to, you know, we're, gonna, we're paying 2500 bucks for this data, and I get it. You have to have it by July 31st for right. permit. Understood. But since we're paying 2500 bucks, and we're going to have to get into our swamp program anyhow, you know, I don't want it to sit there for three years on somebody's desk right. and not get into the system. I, I get that, yeah. And so I'm just a little bit concerned about it. Making sure, I mean, we, we've spent the money on the software. Right. And now we've got data. The two weren't together. I don't see a plan to get them together at any point. Is somebody on top of this? It's kind of my question yeah. here. It is, I mean, the, the, the data can easily be put into that program. Well, I, I get that it can be easily done. I just, is there a plan to do it and when? I mean, we, we spent, what, 20 grand on the software, if I remember right? It wasn't cheap. And, and we've got the data, which is also coming at a cost. And it's just a matter of, okay, we've, we've made the investment. We have to start moving forward and actually utilizing it. Mm -hmm. and, and I think we need to have a plan that says this data will get entered into the software by X date. I don't really care what that date is, but I want to see some kind of a plan that says we're going to get there. Yep. I will um, work on that once Mr. Peters gets back on his vacation. We'll talk about a game plan. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Good. Good. Um, okay, so uh, we're going to, I hope, approve the um, resolution for services agreement for the uh, 2018 MS4 plan and outfall inspections with WSB in the amount of 2,500 to uh, how many? 2520. 20, 20, 25? 2520. 20. 20. 20. 20. 20. 20. 20. Is there a motion? So moved. Is there a second? No second. Okay, motion has been made by Ms. Bruce and seconded by Mr. Molitor. Um, further discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor signify with aye. 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 All those opposed, motion passes 4-0. So that uh, concludes our business items, and we move on to administrative items. Mr. Brony. Uh, yes, uh, thank you, Madam Mayor and Council. I just have a few items to review with you. Um, do have a meeting upcoming, not this Wednesday, but the following Wednesday with the Mon Fire to, uh, Commission meeting. Um, I think you all received that invite last week. Um, you probably had the date, but you got the official invite. Um, our next meeting will be three weeks from tonight. We have another long gap. There happens to be five Mondays in this month of July. So we won't meet until three additional weeks from now. And then the final item I have is uh, just before the start of this meeting, um, Mr. Hornby was able to put together a meeting between some city staff himself and the Met Council engineers 
or the topic of discussion will be the Enchanted Road Tuxedo um, project. In addition to that, uh, the boat launch. Um, as people on the council know, um, that project was a combo platter with Met Council's uh, broken sewer main, or uh, uh, yeah, sewer main last year. Um, one of the things that we've paused the project momentarily for is that our boat launch did have some issues with uh, its wear and tear on it, but the construction project mostly related to the Met Council's pipe install kind of chewed up the, the boat launch a little bit more. And so what we wanted to do was discuss with Met Council a game plan to pave both the road and the boat launch at the same time. We didn't want to just go forward with our, our paving. We could have, but we decided not to. Um, and then have them come back later and with, in conjunction with us to pave the boat launch. So that was the idea of the slight pause. We have that meeting set for this Friday. When we get to the August 6th meeting, we should have a game plan hopefully in place. Um, just an FYI, the, the quote that the Met Council received was quite high. And so um, I don't feel the city's in any position to kind of throw in more money, so to speak, into this particular project. We, we did budget some money for the fix-up of the boat launch um, in the project overall, not knowing that that council's going to come through and do what they did. So I'm going to kind of put this on them to help us with, which is kind of what they promised. Um, but we'll see where we get, and we'll get back to the council uh, in three weeks and let you know where we stand. But that's our goal. Um, could do, Another option could be we don't do the boat launch until next year and try to get a better price. I mean, we'll, we'll just talk through some options and hopefully bring those back to you for, for consideration in three weeks. So. Okay, keep us posted. Absolutely. Um, any, any other staff Just requests? to confirm uh, next week's planning commission meeting, who will be attending that? Okay. I will not. What day is it? Uh, Monday. It's the 23rd. I can, I can do it. Okay. 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 Um, council reports. You want to start? Sure. Uh, LMCD, uh, we are in the process of reviewing fee structures for services provided. Um, and we're also having some discussions on definitional items of uh, canopies and boathouses. Um, as we see in the city, sometimes market responds to Ordinances in order to um, try to, uh, we're having some discussions about how what we do, how we define a canopy versus uh, a cover on the boat level. Yeah. Uh, there's implications for setbacks and, and so forth. So um, that's ongoing, and uh, so those are kind of the big things on the Elm City's agenda right now. Okay. Ms. Bruce, um, we have a. I understand we're going to have another discussion on the water storage August 6th. on August 6th. Correct. And I just drafted some questions that I wanted to give to other council members and to staff, and maybe we can, we can find the answers to those questions in the meantime. So I just brought copies that I um, will just pass on down. And we don't have to talk about them tonight. But just they're just questions that I had that I'd like to have answers to. <coughs> and that's all I have. Okay. Oh, I'm going to be at the Mount Fire Commission meeting on Wednesday, the 25th, too. Okay. And Mr. Chamberlain. At our uh, June Pioneer Sarah Creek meeting we approve the operating budget for 2019 there get theirs approved real quick uh, assessments didn't change in total but as they typically do every year the amounts to the various members shift based on the right. market values of the properties within the watershed so ours went up 11 percent for this next year so additional fifteen hundred and one dollars would be assessment total would be fifteen thousand one ten ninety one. Okay. 
Um, and this meeting that would have been for July, which would have been this Thursday, has been canceled due to no active agenda. So you get a break. Good. <laughs> All right. Um, so um, my report, um, there was no Gillespie board meeting um, this this past week, last week. Also, no Northwest League meeting. They kind of take, um, they take actually July and August off. Uh, next week, I will be attending a dinner hosted by um, Mayor Marv Johnson of Independence, and he is hosting the National Small Cities event um, this year and has invited the mayors from our Northwest League to um, attend, so I will plan on doing that. I will be attending the fire meeting as well. And then um, I've had several meetings with various residents regarding different issues. And one of the things I'd like to do this evening is just uh, I'd like to say thank you to uh, Gary Peters for all of his, his work here in our city. And I've realized that he has a lot on his plate. And yet when a resident calls and says they have some issues, he's more than happy and quick to go out and meet with them and try and resolve their issues. In fact, one lady sent an email saying they've got potholes in, in their street. She you know, was wondering when they can be fixed. And he had his guys out there the very next day fixing these potholes. Um, I met with him and a resident that was having some runoff issues. And again, he was more than willing to meet with us, uh, Gary and, and the resident and myself, and talk about different possible solutions and, and to try and work this through. And I just think it's, it's really very, very good when we have a public works director that um, is really there for our residents and wants to serve and help our residents. And he's just done a fantastic job with that, and I really wanted to thank him for that. I also wanted to thank Paul Falls. Because again, when people call and say, you know, there's speeders on our road, can you do something? He's very quick to say, I'll send out an officer and maybe they can sit there for a while. I'll send out the speed sign. We'll put that out there. Again, very um, quick to try and respond to requests and, and uh, be there to serve our residents. And the third person I'd like to... Um, point out this evening is Mike Baroni because again with the Halstead project there's been lots of complaints and a lot of issues going on far more than any of us realize and Mike has been there and um, has actually resolved a number of those issues particularly with some of the residents and also if you remember the um, Stillwell issue that was years in the making um, he got that resolved and I just want to thank all of our staff I mean I'm pointing these three people out tonight but there's other people that deserve it as well because we have a fabulous staff um, they really are here to serve our residents and to work with us and I really appreciate that they make us look good and um, and that's that's really really wonderful great people to work with Brian David um, Cassandra, um, Chris, all of all of our staff, wonderful people, and so I want to say thank you, and these three people that I just mentioned in particular. So with that, that's all I have. Thank you very much. Of course, our consultants are wonderful as well. <laughs> Is there a motion to adjourn? So moved. Is there a second? A no second. Okay, motion has been made and seconded. All those in favor, signify with aye. 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 All those opposed, motion passes. For all.